from the deepest, darkest recesses of Dangerous Nerds headquarters. Keith Moncrief and Gary Cassell. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Pop Culture Minefield. That is Keith down there. And, and this, guy, this guy over here, that's Josh Roberts. He's a, a friend of uh, Keith's and mine that owns uh, or owned a comic shop in uh, Springfield, Missouri. And he, Spring he is one of the major people of the moment. He, In my mind, you represent a particular group of people that are just getting the heck beat out of them. Oh, oh yeah. Well, well this has been me. going on for a while. Since Diamond <laughs> changed its practices uh, and forcing these resellers, retailers, to um, buy the properties from them rather than uh, being able to return them when they didn't sell. Yeah, and uh, that was the beginning of the end for the mom and pop uh, comic shops, and uh, because then they were forced to buy properties that they couldn't get rid of, and it created uh, a false inflation of sales for the comic companies, Marvel and DC. So they liked it, so they allowed this to be done to their dedicated retailers, yeah. and that's why I I I don't, uh, you know, I don't let them off for this. They're as guilty as Diamond itself. And Diamond used strong arm tactics, and you, your microphone's really um, making noises. It's, Here, uh, how about that? Okay. And uh, basically, you know, they, they were forcing these retailers to buy. You, you want the, this title? Well, gosh, you know, if you buy that, you're going to have to buy these other titles that suck. And so guys like Josh that own these shops were forced to buy titles they couldn't get rid of, that they were going to get stuck with. And so often, I bet, couldn't even give them away. And, you know, it was, it's, it's a mobster mafia type tactic that Diamond used. And, now, uh, Josh, Josh, in your opinion, what in your mind, your memory, what was the first title that you as a business owner had to deal with that with you know wow that's a good question because the thing is the diamond tried to do it kind of i wouldn't say subversively but subtly at first uh by offering um variant covers that were sought after variant covers but in order to qualify to buy them, you had to buy a certain number of a title that you wouldn't necessarily buy as many of. And at first, mm -hmm. some of the numbers weren't unreasonable. You know, like if I was ordering 15 copies of a second or third tier title, they would say, well, if you order 18 copies, then you can get this, this book. So I'd say, okay, well, I'll bump it up a few, few copies, no big deal. But when that really caught on, then they started increasing it and it turned into not numbers, but percentages. So they would say things like, if you want the uh, really spectacular variant for Amazing Spider-Man for this new issue, whatever you order of Amazing Spider-Man, you have to order two and a half times that of this other second or third tier title. So they were artificially trying to inflate the sales of their second and third tier titles to get you to, with the enticement of one copy of one variant cover that you might be able to sell for, you know, 10 or 20 bucks. And so I personally uh, got to the point pretty quickly where I, I would very rarely fall into the trap. And like I said, if it was a few copies here and there to qualify for a variant, I would do it. But they got so ridiculous with their percentages because like I said, they, they would say, you have to order two and a half times of a major title of a third tier title in order to qualify for these variants. And so that, it, the, the term is predatory marketing. It is. And, yes. That that's is the de it. very definition of it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the thing that makes me sick is that this shit started, as I recall, in the 90s with them. And uh, Oh, yeah. With the, with the first big variant cover craze is when it really caught on. Yeah, and this practice of um, not being able to do returns, too. Right. And that was the beginning of the end for for the independent comic retailer. Um, you, you know, because uh, you can't return books that don't sell. No, I've never heard of that, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, and here's how Diamond got around that. They would offer returnability, 
but they would never offer you returnability on something <clears throat> that you weren't going to sell anyway. Like, for example, a lot of times I would get returnability on Amazing Spider-Man, but that's a book that we were selling out of. So it's pointless to offer me returnability on the top tier book. Yeah. You know, it's basically they may as well not even be bothered. Right. And at the same time, when they're doing their predatory marketing to get you to order more of the second and third tier books, <clears throat> then you are literally stuck with the extra copies of those because they almost never offered you any returnability there. Wow. Now, I will say this. In the last three or four years, uh, several of the independent publishers started offering their own returnability. So it was... You know, like Valiant did a, a very good job with returnability through their company. IDW got a little bit better with it. Um, those were the two main ones. Every once in a while, you'd get a return from Dynamite Entertainment. Uh, uh, but that was, you know, those were the three that I can remember off the top of my head that had a consistent returnability. And they did things right. Uh, Valiant, for example, when they relaunched all of their titles, they said, we have 100% returnability. So order as many as you want, because whatever you don't sell, you can send it all back. And they held to it. So on certain titles like the new Bloodshot and the new Harbinger, the new Exo Manowar, when they first came out, I ordered significantly heavier than I would have because I knew that I could return what I didn't sell. Now, what that does for a small business, a small store especially, is that gives you a real number of what you're selling of a title. You know, because we all do some kind of weekly inventory of our new comics. It's called cycle sheets or cycle sheeting to try to get a gauge of what we're selling off the shelf versus what we have in our subscriber boxes. And that what that is supposed to allow us the information that we need. So when we do the next order, we know how many to put on the shelf. So yeah. Yeah. when you're offered 100 percent returnability, you can get a real number instead of guessing. And that's where the failing comes with the big two is if I have to guess if there's a new Jane Grey series, I have to guess, well, am I going to sell 50 of it? Am I going to sell 10 of it? How many am I going to sell? So if there was returnability, you could get a hard, fast number. But then the other problem is the fact that, well, the, the fact that you have to order comics two months in advance has always been an yeah, issue, yeah. especially with, with smaller comic book stores. Because by the time I get the third issue of a book, I'm just now see, or by the time I order the third issue of a book, I'm just now getting the first issue. So if the first issue bombs, I've still got two and three that I've already ordered coming down the pike. And, and, I, and there's no way, the other problem, that creates another problem with Diamond in that they do not let you change your order ever. Their policy says, in order for you to adjust your order, an item has to be late. So their definition of late is four months after the release date. Well, you order two months ahead of time. It has to be four months late. That's a six month window before you would even have an opportunity to cut your order on an item. How did they expect to uh, keep going with practices like that? I don't know, but here's where it gets even better because there was that six month window and a lot of statues and toy lines and non comic books. Well, even hardcovers and collections, a lot of times would get pushed back on their release date. They stopped putting the release date on their website for the items that you had ordered. Are you kidding me? So when you went to the website to see where this item was and when it was supposed to come out, it always said TBD to be decided on the release date oh, because dude, no yeah. release date, they don't have to let you cut your order. Wow. Yeah. Un wow. I I'm sorry. I'm, it's a movie quote. Unfucking believable. No. I, yeah. I mean, I loved owning a comic book store, except having to deal with getting comics. What an unpleasant business. It oh, yeah. really is. Um, I mean, and, that, that, uh, that definitely is love. You, you got to love it. You're not in it to get rich. You're in it because no. you love it. No, and, that's the other thing. On a $4 comic book, I made 80 cents profit. That's, that's worse than 
you know, the business between the um, studios, release studios, and movie theaters. Yeah. Because a lot of them make a, a dime to every $12 uh, for some movie releases. And, um, like, the bigger the title, the less the theater makes uh, up front. And, right. uh, so and that's actually gotten here. better over the years. It used to be even worse, but it's still... Yeah, the the movie theaters don't make. That's why concessions are so expensive at a movie yep. theater. Because that's tell the people, only place that they can make a profit. And I tell people if you if you support your theater and like your theater, buy concessions. Yeah, buy because popcorn. that's what keeps them open. Yeah, like when Star Wars would get released, George Lucas had created this new thing that they weren't able to make any money off of the ticket sales. One hundred percent of all ticket sales went to the studio. Well, and, a few years ago. Uh, when, before the Campbell 16 went out of business, I talked to the manager there and he said that they made 50 cents off of each movie ticket, period. No matter what the price of the movie ticket was, they got 50 cents. Yeah. Looks right, like, I got uh, I got to take a phone call. So all right. Why don't you guys I'll drop continue? You out. I'll drop you out. Uh, but anyway, yeah, because uh, I remember Campbell 16. That was like my favorite theater in town. Yeah, that was a great theater. And... Um, I miss it, but um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Alamo is kind of cool with what they do, but it's it doesn't feel like a regular theater experience. It feels like a dinner in a theater. Yeah, uh, yeah. Dinner and in a I movie. That. Don't get me wrong. I like that, but if you just if you want just the standard movie theater experience, I think AMC is the way to go at this point. Yeah, it's where we tended to go when I was living in Springfield. Or the Moxie. I mean, the Moxie is a great independent theater here in Springfield, and they do a great job of getting new release avant-garde films that, you know, they're not going to get Star Wars, but they, you know, they're going to get things like, what was the foreign film that won all the Academy Awards this year? The Oh, it's not even that good. Parasite? Uh, Parasite. I... Right. But see, that's a movie that would play at the Moxie in Springfield before it would play at the big theaters until it got Oscar notice. Here's, here's what I learned in writing uh, from one of my professors. It's easy to write characters nobody cares about. It's hard to write characters that your audience identifies with. True. And, and when you watch, you don't care about any of these characters. Um, and it's like, uh, first of all, it's also a foreign film. It's not American. It's not. How did that get the Oscar for that? When it was released theatrically foreign, uh, you know, overseas in Korea, um, I didn't think it was a very good film. I mean, it, I haven't seen it. If so I had I a didn't... choice between watching it and a really, really awful film, I would watch it. But I watched it one time. Nobody prompted me. This is long before it was ever nominated. I saw it, and I was like, eh, it's a, eh. you yeah. know, it's it's just a bunch of detestable people. You know, and uh, it's sort of like that that new Netflix series, uh, King of the Tigers. Um, oh, Tiger King, watching. yeah. Yeah, Tiger King. Everybody's going crazy over that. I haven't watched it yet. I watched watch. it, and there's not one decent person in that freaking documentary. Right. Not one. There are people there that were being very predatory with the other, uh, mm -hmm. people doing things to take advantage of somebody in order to get what they wanted. I mean, the, the documentarian that shot the, the docu-series thing, I mean, he admits it. He's like, yeah, I did this for him so I could get what I wanted. It's yeah. Like, everybody was predatorial with each other. And in the end, it, they were all kind of scummy, in my opinion. And I, mm -hmm. I just like, uh, but I couldn't tell. It was like watching a train wreck. You just, you just like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I binged the whole series, and I was like, yeah, yeah that's pretty good. Um, it's only seven episodes, right? Yeah, it's not very long. Yeah, uh, I got to I all plan on watching it. You know, I've got the time. So, yeah, no, now that we're all self locking in, you know, and yep. I, I'll, I did that anyway. I'm, I'm very much an isolationist as an, as an introvert. So I'm, I, you can pretty much catch me right here in front of that eagle from Space 1999. Yeah, every day for about eight to ten hours. Wow, it's what I do. I'm always on the computer working. And uh, so I go downstairs to wash dishes for a little bit, and then I um, come back up here and work. Um, I socialize here. Yeah. yeah. So well, like, that fits in perfectly, you know, with the stay-at-home thing. You can still do this and socialize with people. And 
Yeah, it's like I, I said on my Facebook page. I said, I've been training for this shit for 30 some years. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, hit me with your best shot, virus. Yeah, you know, my problem is like my girlfriend uh, and and her her kids. They just want to, you know, they'll like to mess around and joke and stuff. And they're always like touching me, and I'm like, oh. stop, stop touching me, stop touching me. <laughs> my girlfriend's like, but I love you so much. I said, if you love me that much, you will stop touching me. Yeah, you know, because yep. you go out into the world and you work in an office. She's still going out and working. I said, so you're having contact with other people and you bring that home to me. I said, and that's how I get sick. Uh, and I can handle it because I got the flu last year really bad. And uh, I also got, the, what was that, the shingles, Oh, which really knocked me for a loop. I was down sure. for over a week with that. And I had the medicine, an antiviral and prednisone. And still it knocked me for a loop. Uh, but that's because my immune system is really uh, depressed. It's not yeah. gone. It's really depressed. Sure. And it takes longer to kick in. It takes longer for it to do its job. Uh, it usually takes twice as long. So, like I said, with that cut finger, it's going to take me two weeks yeah. to recover from this stupid thing. Um, and uh, it's what happens. Then on top of that, I'm an asthmatic. And people, I keep telling people, this isn't a flu-like disease that's going around, the uh, the the disease. I'm not going to say the name of it because um, people are getting, like, flagged on YouTube for oh, saying it. Yeah. So I'll just say that that virus um, is um, more like a pneumonia. Right, it it's more respiratory. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it really focuses on uh, inflammation in the lungs. Yeah, and uh, and that of course is deadly for people with uh, asthma. Oh yeah, and then of course people like me with diabetes, it's hard for me to fight it off naturally. Mm -hmm. So the odds are, if if I get it, I would probably die from it. Uh, and you know, I'm cool with it. If I die, it it happens. But, well, let's uh, prevent that from happening. I mean, that's, that's the whole point of this is it only takes some common sense prevention to keep you safe from being exposed to it. Yeah. That's it's the tough. problem. Too many people are not using common sense. Yeah, it's like uh, I made fun of my girlfriend because like um, she uh, pours me a drink and then she picks it up like this to oh. hand it to me. And I'm looking at her like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> so what I did is I gauged where her fingers <clears throat> didn't touch right here. And that was the only spot I drank from. And um, but I'm like, you know, you guys don't think. And I came up in the medical field. I was a combat medic in the army, a uh, nurse, and I was also uh, a paramedic. And so I understand aseptic procedure and I've used it for years and I still use it. Um, like when I, it's like, uh, there was this joke going around about touching things like, um, okay, here, prime example. Here you go. Here it is. Right. Yeah. Of course you got to pick it up and squirt with it. And then as a person who's paranoid about disease goes, but is this clean? So I have to sterilize it and spray it with something and wipe it down. And then I'm looking at the thing that just sterilized. It <laughs> the skin, like, are you clean? So that I'm, um doing that one so i'm i'm like really weird uh hold on a second come around here and show off your your t-shirt we're recording i like that t-shirt there we go that's my stepdaughter dava hi. what does it hi what does that's that say uh it says um kerosene, kerosene skate, skate shop in Joppa. Oh, nice uh because her family owned it oh cool and, and now they they closed it sort of uh, to open up the uh, bar. He yeah he met the uh, micro wolf. Yep. <laughs> you good baby. Um. Anyway, so uh, basically, uh, they own the skate shop, and then Alex, the brother who is a pro skater, retired, uh, decided to open the um um the bar which is actually a restaurant with a bar oh, okay yeah it's a tiki bar and it's oh, nice uh i've eaten there a lot and i gotta tell you it's amazing and they're closed right now uh because of this sure. thing but as soon as they open back up boy it's gonna I'm, I'm looking forward to going back there um i love they have this um one that's uh 
super nachos or something like that or the grand nachos and it's basically what it is it's an open face sandwich of pork pulled pork barbecue with apple slaw it, it tastes just like a sweeter coleslaw and then it's covered barbecue sauce and then you've got hot sauces on the wall and you pick the hot sauce you like and you dash it all over it it's it's like eating uh a barbecue sandwich on nacho ch uh, chips nice that sounds and good i'm telling you it's amazing and you can eat there for under nine bucks cool you know uh i i love it and uh so i'm looking forward to when they open up again because i i love their food i freaking love their food you know, you know I, alex is a really good cook there have always been a lot of good places to eat in <laughs> Copland. which because i mean when i used to travel down there for work i would go to Artie's, the greek restaurant because it was great i'd go to instant karma because who doesn't want a deep fried hot dog you know right when uh when pizza by um, the tornado there's pizza a couple of places well, yeah, before the a, tornado pizza by stout was probably one of the best pizzas i had ever eaten yeah the, uh, there are sections of buildings just gone and it's yeah from that tornado there's keith he's back now we can get back to doing the show i'll edit all this we should crap. play the welcome back cotter theme I, for his I, intro we would get gigged we would get gigged and they would, yeah, they, they would block us welcome YouTube. back Welcome hey, hey. back. And um, so uh, we were talking about Joplin food. Yeah. And, oh, okay. Um, yeah. I, I don't think uh, I'll edit it. I don't think I'll edit out while he was gone. Uh, we'll just uh, put it back, you know, just basically just keep moving forward. Um, uh, but, uh, let, me at least, let me at least ask this. Um, you know, given given what has happened up to this point do you believe it is possible outside of dc and marvel and diamond do you think it's possible for everyone that would like to stay in all the other companies to continue to do stuff especially those particular ones that have decided to make changes not just with returnability but with the type of paper that they use and using newsprint rather than a really expensive, glossy paper, do you think it's possible for any of these companies to? I think it's possible for a lot of them to stay in. I mean, honestly, it's going to depend upon how long they're without revenue because yeah. it, think about the trickle down of this. Uh, mm -hmm. No comics have been shipped to publishers. No publishers have shipped comics out to Diamond. Diamond's not shipping out to retailers. And so then Diamond is also not paying their vendors. And the vendors are the publishers who then turn around and use that money to pay the creatives. So yeah. nobody in the comic industry is generating any income through printed and shipped product right now. So what they're doing is they're scrambling to get some kind of digital version of their product available for people to buy. Some of them have it in place already. You know, Marvel and DC both have their own online subscriptions, but there's yeah. always been a, a, a several month gap between new releases and when you can view them online. And they did that to support the, the local comic shops and, and the printed industry. I could see where a majority of comics go directly to digital media. And, and it, you know, it could be something where some of the companies uh, <clears throat> only offer it digitally unless you want to pay a little extra to get a physical copy printed because then they could mm -hmm. put together a, an order and have it printed to order uh, for the people like us that still like that physical copy of a comic. I could see where they go to a lot more graphic novel content that's original content in that format instead of the monthly titles. Um, you know, everything's kind of up in the air right now, so it's hard to know where it's all going to land. But yeah. Yeah. the the hardest thing is what are these what are these writers and artists and colorists and letters? What are they going to do in the meantime? What are they doing right now? Because if they're not getting any work and they're not getting paid from the companies that they've signed contracts with, how are they going to make money in this interim until we can get back to some new normal with the comic industry? I, you know, 
it's like um, Kelly Jones uh, said uh, the other day um, that, uh, you know, from the ashes, something new will, will, will arise out of this. Um, yeah. But what is it going to be? I don't know. Who is it going to be? I don't know. DC uh, and Marvel, Marvel in particular, uh, being owned by Disney, uh, they could just focus on doing sales a different way. And um, I don't understand. Well, that's, that's, that's really what a lot of the changes have been, uh, especially mm -hmm. with Warner Brothers. In the aftermath of what happened after no, Justice no, League. Hold on one second. February, oh. DC pulled out of Diamond. Yeah, they pulled yes, out. Yes, I know. Yes. Uh, I, don't, I think I, they, they didn't pull out early enough because uh, they still impregnated um, Diamond. <laughs> but they pulled out in February to go on their own. So I wanted to point that out. Yeah, well, Continue, we, we, sir. We, we, we all know how the rhythm method works. But um, no, it's just uh, I think what I was getting to with that is that in the aftermath of what happened with Justice League with Warner Brothers, and, and what happened with DC Entertainment and how it was divided up, where, you know, uh, all the television stuff went to Warner Television, all the film stuff went to Warner Film, and the leftover amount got shoved into this new section that they had created with a lot of other stuff from Warner Brothers, where this um, now a new person's been hired to come in and basically take all of this stuff, and I think it's under, it's under all of this titled stuff, but it comes under lifestyle branding and everything else. This is all the stuff that they are trying to make it to where it brings in more money. Um, if it doesn't, they're going to start getting rid of stuff, and comics were poured into that. You know, norm. Now, for us, we would think you would want your comics to be a, a whole separate person uh, uh, area, publishing whatever else. But since everybody's getting out of publishing, everybody is shoving their comics into that third category. So they're mixing the comics with the tennis shoes and and and, right. and the laptops and the t-shirts and well, and that's because they're looking at it solely from revenue, and that's yeah. something that shortly after Disney purchased. Uh, Marvel and Lucasfilm and all of that, they said that the comic portion of their business was their lowest earner. And mm -hmm. they were entertaining the idea of licensing out those products and letting someone else publish the comics. Right yeah. after that is when IDW started doing Star Wars Adventures, which was a kid-friendly Star Wars comic. And then they started doing the Marvel uh titles that were kid friendly of Spider-Man and Black Panther and the Avengers. And mm -hmm. I guarantee you that what Disney was doing there was testing the market to see how many copies of a kid friendly book they could sell because they're going to use that statistical model to decide if it's worth it to license out their main product. And everybody's trying to basically make headway and be very friendly with Scholastic. I'm oh, yeah. thinking that's how DC is well, that's try been to going on for a there. while. Um, cause IDW, uh, you know, saddled up to him back in, um, the early, uh, 20 teens. Uh, mm -hmm. I, cause, uh, I was working on that, um, scholastic book. I had to step away from it because it was taking too long to get stuff to me. And, yeah. uh, and I said, I, I, you know, I'm, it's cutting into my next job. So mm -hmm. I had to back out of it. I felt bad for that, but it was, you know, I told Tom, uh, you know, I just can't do it. But that I believe part of that was because Scholastic uh, manages everything through committee, and they t they drag things out, and that's I consider that bad for the comic industry, um, yeah. because comic industry is thirty days, thirty days, thirty days, right. thirty days, thirty right. days. People 30 want days. that instant gratification or that thirty day gratification in the case of monthly titles. Exactly. And when you take that away, they're going to move on to something else. That's yeah, what I've so. said forever. The first thing, anybody who uh, he who came to me when my store was open and asked if I had any advice on doing their own self-publishing, I would say you need to have the whole story done before you release the first issue. Because if you can't provide the next issue in a timely manner, people are going to forget about it and move on to something else. And that's why I prefer... There's too much out I'm there. I'm working on graphic novels because... Uh, 
like I like it takes a year, sometimes even longer on some of those books. If you're, I do a, a, like everything outside of the original writing on some of them. Uh, I had one graphic novel, it was 120 pages, and it took me two years to finish. Sure. I like that. I like that. I don't want to have that pressure of you've got 30 days. Because I had that with one graphic novel. It had to be done in technically 30 days from when we started it. It took a week to write the script. That gave me three weeks to draw 70-some pages. And I did. I I drew all 77 pages for that graphic novel for IDW. And uh, Ted Adams and Chris Ryle said that I I broke some sort of record uh, doing that, finishing an entire graphic novel in 20-some days, 22 days, I think it was. But I hated that. I never want to have a deadline like that again, ever again. I like being relaxed, doing what I do. And uh, but going into the you know the the industry thrives on that individual floppy sales is you know how they make their bread and butter. The thing is though, the comic industry hasn't technically turned a profit since about seventy four seventy five. Uh, they've just been breaking even because you brought up licensing, and licensing is how DC and Marvel made their money, turned their profits. Oh, yeah. uh, they would license and merchandise, license and merchandise. And uh, uh, the comics just kept the thing alive. And they looked at that. It was basically marketing what they were going to make the money off of through the licensing and merchandise. And uh, uh, But they seem to have kind of like fallen away from that and don't seem to understand that anymore. And they're creating comics that don't really sell anything. Nobody's buying this shit. Well, what you see... Yeah. What, what I saw is, let's see, I read an article from another uh, comic book store, I think out of Tennessee, maybe, that's been around for over 30 years. And what he was saying was correct. 90% of the comics that you put on the shelf, that's not right. Anyway, t- 10% of the comics published are going to sell out basically is what he was saying the other 90 percent of the titles that you put on the shelf you're going to have some leftover and so i think that that holds true the top 10 of the top 100 are books that would sell regardless and then everything else you you're you know you're going to have some pockets of popularity you're going to have some titles that will sell through pretty quickly uh, and consistently uh but then the rest of it it doesn't matter if you order one. It doesn't matter if you order a hundred. You're going to have some left over. So the the biggest obstacle for a comic book store is what do you do with that leftover product? Because like we've talked about, you can't return it. So what are you going to do now? Are you going to discount it? Because if you start discounting it on a regular basis, you're going to start stop selling as many new issues because people will just wait until you discount it to buy it then. So it's kind of a it's kind of a snowball rolling downhill. So do you wait and then just throw them all in the back issues at full cover price? I did that most of the time. And let me tell you, when I closed my store, that's what I had the most of was four dollar comics that were back issues. So yeah. Yeah. that had been new comics at some point. So it's hard to know. There's no easy statistical model for how to sell through product because no matter how much analysis you do of it, you end up with something left over. It's kind of a weird psychological thing where, because I would notice if, if I had a comic that I had four copies on the shelf of, I'm more <laughs> likely to sell those four copies because I have four than if I just have one copy of something on the shelf. Because nobody wants to buy the last one. Yeah. yeah. So it's there's some weird psychology going on. And then, you know, it's it, well, it's impossible to guess how well any single title is going to sell until you can track it for a while. Well, then this leads me into uh, the question about certain uh, uh, store owners talking about just not selling new comics and just dealing with older comics. It's become a bigger a trend. Mm-hmm. Because, and here's why, like I told you before, on a $4 comic, I made 80 cents profit. But mm-hmm. if somebody brings that same $4 comic into my store, even if I pay them $2 for it, 
I can still make $2 if I sell it. So the back issue market is a much easier profit margin to control. Now, you don't sell the same volume as you sell of new product, but you do make a bigger profit on what you do sell and you can control your profit margin because if somebody brings in an amazing fantasy 15, you can offer them a lot more because you know that it's a great book and you're going to flip it and you're going to make a good amount of money. But you can also, if somebody brings in a long box of, of junk from the eighties, you can pay them 10 bucks for the whole long box. And then if you sell them all for a dollar a piece, you're still going to make a good profit margin on that. So that's no. why so many stores have moved to that model. The problem is, how do you get people in the door when all you have are old comics? Uh, you know what? The only thing that I've found is through their relationship with uh, uh, Hollywood. I mean, these books are going to sit on the shelves. And with the exception of someone being a legacy collector, the only other way is to spark up interest in another area through either a, 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 an animated cartoon, a television series, or a film. Mm -hmm. And uh, outside of that, I can't even begin to even guess how to get people in the door unless you just want to uh, try to mix and match what you have. Try to focus in on the really well-known IP meaning, you know, DC Marvel characters, obviously, and whatever characters are being focused on heavily. So, you know, for if I were running a shop right now, I'd be focusing on all of the legacy Marvel characters, all of the legacy DC characters. I'd constantly have, like, episodes of, of Justice League action and various other shows constantly running somewhere in the store, so that when the kids come in, you know, you can reinforce that with them and, mm -hmm. and help try to keep that alive and try. I mean, I would definitely sell T-shirts and other things, but I wouldn't try to lean too heavily on that stuff, especially on 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 uh, figurines and everything else. That's the, I mean, was that hard to sell for you? Oh, yeah. Did, did those... I learned years ago that the profit margin on toys and statues and most other things that are non-comic is so minuscule that you have to yeah. really, really keep it close to the vest as far as what you order. And I'll give you an example. Yeah. Uh, for years, when McFarlane was doing his assortments of Spawn figures or, or um, the sports figures and things like that, there were 12 mm -hmm. figures in a case. OK, based on your cost or my cost at after I sold the ninth figure, I broke even. So I could only make a profit on the th last three figures in a 12 figure case. Damn. So what that led to was the good thing about McFarland stuff was there were usually a couple of rare figures that you could mark up to a higher price. And then you could make money a little faster or make a little more money. But you always had at least one peg hanger that nobody wanted. So you're going to have to discount that one to get rid of it. So it kind of all balances out. But if you think about that, so 75% sell through is the break even point on most of those other items. Some of them you get a better profit margin, but the majority of that stuff, especially, and again, I'm talking from diamonds perspective, that's having everything distributed through diamond. Those were the profit margins for me. So, it made it really difficult. It made it to where on on most things, if it was even if it was a mainstream item, I needed to know from my customer base if I was going to get close to or possibly sell through it before I ordered it. Here's the other problem, though. Back to what I said. When you order two months in advance, good luck getting people to commit to something. Yeah, it's... Uh... <clears throat> Because that was the problem I ran into. I would say, okay, I've got to order this Marvel Legends assortment by Tuesday. How many of you are going to want it? Oh, well, uh, I'll have to look at it first. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm asking. I'm not going to have it in the store for you to look at it if I don't know that somebody's going to buy it. So there's the conundrum you run into. Well, now, the event books. 
and in your time of owning your store, really in the time that you've been in the business, there have been a lot of event books. Oh, and let yeah. me just point to one in particular. Let's just go with Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of books connected to that, plus the main book. How well did that do for you from your, from your perspective? It's a law of diminishing returns, which is, which is the case with a lot of titles in general. When a new yeah. title comes out, there's there's a bit of a bump in sales because it's something new. It's a number one issue. It's collectible. It's limited edition, whatever people want to say. So you always sell, for the most part, you always sell more of the first issue of a book than you're ever going to sell of any other issue. There are a few yeah. exceptions to that, but very few. Event book, The problem with an event book is, again, it's a mentality issue with comic book collectors and readers. For whatever reason, if they know it's finite, they're less likely to buy it. And I don't know why, I can't explain it to you, but if you think about it, mini series always sell worse than ongoing series. Hmm. And that, I, I, I don't know why, I can't explain it. But, so when you throw an event book out there that's a crossover with every other title in this universe and it's gonna run for six months, there's a percentage of people that say, I'm on board. I want every one of them. There's a percentage of people who say, I'll just wait for the collected edition. And there's a percentage of people who say, uh, do I have to read every one of these or can I just read the ones I like? So again, how, how do you order based on those, those attitudes? I don't, I mean, it's a, it's a crapshoot really. And on top of that, how did you, I mean, having the shop, there is no way you could have read all the books to keep up with everything. So, no. I, I mean, just... <laughs> well, the, the thing is, you ha I had to rely on the reviews of other people for some things. I mean, the, the previews catalog, which was the order catalog for Diamond, you could go yeah. through there and get you know, you could get a tagline or a couple of lines of explanation of what a book was about. So you could kind of fake it till you make it with some of your customers. But if somebody came in asking, hey, what's going on in Amazing Spider-Man? You can't just say, uh, well, read the previews, it'll tell you, you know. So I was lucky enough that I had employees that when they worked for me that were were really into comics. And so they would do a lot of research on their own. And so between mm -hmm. the two or three of us, we could usually get a pretty good coverage of the stuff that was going to come out. But I mean, there were always a few where I'm like, I have no idea what's going on in Incredible Hulk. I haven't read it in years, you know, that kind of thing. So um, there's so much information out there that you would think it would be easier to get it. But there's so much information out there. There's no way to get it all. Uh, now, I might be wrong in this, but wasn't there a time about 15, 20 years ago when there were two catalogs that you had to get that it was more oh, yeah. than just Diamond? There was one other company that was actually doing it at the time? Yes. There was a company called Capital City for years. For okay. years, there were two distributors, Diamond and Capital City. As yeah. far as I remember, Capital City had an exclusive contract with Marvel. Diamond had DC. I could be wrong there, but that's the way I remember it. And, that, and I think that both, was it. And then they both distributed everything else. So Capital City was actually a distribution run through or in conjunction with a comic book store. And so when it... I'll be back. It started having financial problems. And so they were going to close... And Diamond took that opportunity to buy their assets and merge them into Diamond. And that's what created this monopoly that we've all dealt with since then. I believe that happened in the mid to late 90s, 1990s, because I had started working for the company that I worked for forever that did comics. But I think when yeah. I first started, I'm fairly certain when I first started with them in 1996, we still had the two distributors. And That's it, what I remember. There were two catalogs to get. Yeah. One was called Advanced Comics, and the other one was called Previews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. 
Yep, that was Capital huh. City and Diamond. Wow. So. Wow. Yep. This is this is just become a mess. I mean, look, I, I, I have. At, there was a time long ago when I had actually entertained the thought of running a comic book shop. Not now. I mean, it, this is insane. This is all of this is just insane. Um, well, here's the thing that is interesting to me. I mean, once once this whole pandemic clears out, once people can go back to work, once non-essential businesses can open again it's going to be really interesting to me what what companies can afford to open again i think a lot of small business small local comic shops are going to go away unfortunately i think some of the smaller publishers are going to go away and i think you could really see more of a movement to crowdfunding for uh comic projects that are not picked up by the big companies which yeah. i don't necessarily think is a bad problem except it circumvents the local comic shop to a certain extent because if if you guys decided you wanted to do a comic on kickstarter my only opportunity as a store owner is to buy copies from you through the kickstarter or contact you and say hey i want to buy 50 copies afterwards so whatever you get print 50 more well you know a lot of the comic creators don't want to deal with that. And they just I want do. to go find it to their, their constituency, their fan base. You will find a lot of us actually do because I'm friends with, well, you know, I'm friends with Chuck Dixon and Graham Nolan. Sure. Uh, and they're always doing Kickstarters for their own campaigns. And they will make deals with uh, independent mom and pop shops. Uh, and in fact, I once said when I started doing Vindicated, which I'm still working on, um, that in the end, my plan is to sell to at least a minimum of five comic shops per state. And if you're able to sell to five comic shops per state, calling them and, and making the deal over the phone or through the internet, that uh, you will have paid off all your expenses. Well, I hope that's true. I don't know that there are five comic book stores in every state. Mm. <laughs> Not today. Yeah. <clears throat> Not today. Where are you going to find five comic book stores in Alaska? It's just, um, it's well, I mean, it's just an ugly mess now. Well, yeah, um, I mean, right now it's all, it's all just speculation. But I, I don't know. I mean, I we've talked for years about how the comic industry was changing, and there was more of a movement towards crowdfunding and digital and online. And I think that this may be the 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 push over the cliff that the comic industry was trying to avoid. But I mean, the whole thing is digital comics are not collectible. And the thing that I always come back to with the comic book industry is it's a collectible market. So yep. Yep. people want physical copies. People want original art that they can hang on a wall. People want something physical that they can hold in their hand and say, my collection has this. Yep. If you mm -hmm. have every copy of Amazing Spider-Man on your computer, all I need is a flash drive and so do I. That's not collectible. There's no value to that. There's no collectability to that. So I believe that when it all settles down, there will still be some version of a physical comic book industry. I think it'll be a lot smaller than it is right now but i think it could also lend itself to all of the a lot of these independent guys being able to make good money on crowdfunding sources and not have to worry about going through a publisher or a distributor or anything like that so i think it could balance out to where it it's a it's a more streamlined but still profitable enterprise for the creative people that are doing it Mm -hmm. That's my hope that's anyway. As long yeah, as that, that, thinking that, hard covers, I, I'll be fine. I was uh, just invited into a group uh, of fellow comic book professionals, real ones, not not the guys that I want to be a comic pro. No, guys who have been in the, in the industry since the '80s, and it is a Plan B type of group on Facebook. Of what do we do now? We need to circumvent uh diamond 
and uh, including the publishers and start putting out comics that go to these comic book shops and start trying to build the, the, the comic industry again when it comes to the resellers and the industry itself. And I like this group, and I'm going to invite you into the group, Josh. Um, uh, I'll send you an invite when I get back over on Facebook. And uh, because I think you, you and other comic book shop owners uh, will help maybe direct these guys, give them some direction. Well, your, your voices are needed because I think if there is to be a tomorrow for the comic book industry, they're going to have to listen to people like you if, if, yeah. if they want to do anything. Because that, to me, is one third of the problem. The moment they stop talking to the business owners and they stopped talking almost directly to the fans. And so if they have no idea what the fans really, what people like yourself see out there and what people are responding to, then they have no idea what to make. That's right. the current problem with Marvel and DC. They True. are deaf right now. And they, they are not listening to anyone other than themselves. And what's happening with these books right now is a direct result of that. Uh, they are only paying attention to what they know. And some of these people, I mean, it's the law of diminishing returns for the most part. Yeah. I mean, as certain right. people leave. Did, I'm sorry. Did you guys hear her burp? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm so no, sorry. I, no, no, I, no, I, I just, I, you, you made a, a face. Yeah, she, she walks into the room and, and fucking burps. So I'm going to have to edit that out. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is just that, you know, you need to realize that some of these people that have become the big names, that the big two are people that didn't come up through the industry. Some of these people are, are, are YA authors or people that come from other industries that don't have, in my opinion, an appreciation for what this art form was in the past. No real understanding of how everything works now. And all they are really are just social media superstars in the fact that they are constantly online, constantly on Twitter, constantly talking to people and getting into these echo chambers with people who may support certain positions that they have, but do not support in a way that these corporations that they're a part of really want them to, which is yeah, the money. That and A it, very well-known uh, SJW posted uh, on Twitter the other day that if you got into comic books to make money, you're in it for the wrong reason, you know, and I'm like, when you get into a business, you're in there to make money. Only an idiot does something not to make money or with an intention to make money. Uh, and I, this is the mindset of some of these SJWs, which is why they don't mind driving businesses into the ground, yeah. which they've done. Because they, the they realize it's not their money. Yeah, it's not theirs. Uh, they, it's like uh, they'll walk away and they'll be able to get hired by someone like Vox, you know. I'll get my voice heard because that's what they want. They just want their voice heard. They don't give two shits about who they're going to hurt in the process of getting their voice heard. And uh, and they've done a lot of damage to the industry, just a ton of damage. And then this that, virus really... this yeah. virus shows up and it's just a coup de gras. It's sort of like, uh, you know, uh, a death by a thousand paper cuts. And it's like somebody goes, you know what? We're just going to go ahead and cut your throat. That's the virus. And uh, yeah. so we're seeing the shutdown. I, I just think that, in my personal opinion, if there is to be any kind of uh, 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 any kind of a survival for this art form, a lot of people that are professionals, real professionals, that have been in the industry for a few years. And when I say a few years, more than 10. Uh, I think it'll be them trying to basically do what they've always done, which is good entertainment, solid characters, solid stories. Uh, I think for the foreseeable future, 
would be to hook into books and just do it the old fashioned way. Print it on newsprint, keep it kind of keep it cheaper, keep well, the price cheap and 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 try to hook people that way. You know, if you get good stories and the books are cheap enough, I think you can hold on to a certain percentage of people and you might allow the industry to hang on a little longer. But I think I think that's a it's good in theory, Keith, but I think the problem you're going to run into is how do you convince the entire industry to lower the pay scale? Because that and ultimately, yes, you could put it back on newsprint. The newsprint that they have now is a lot better as far as the overall look of it. I don't know if you guys have seen those those Jack Kirby collections that came out in the last like 10 years in hardcover. They were all on this newer newsprint that's really beautiful. Like they, they co collected just about everything. Well, a lot of it has to do with how they also do the printing. Right. Because printing is done digitally now as compared to when we were younger where they would do each color right you know and it would go through and it would not i mean how many times did you buy a comic book where you would see color yeah the color was off? shifted yeah <laughs> and, so uh, yes as far as the production of a comic i think there's ways that they can save money but are you going to be able to convince writers and artists to take a lower pay scale that's, i personally don't it's think already low to begin with uh well, I, I know mean, that's the problem it's already low to begin with and I think that these, the companies, well, it, I think if anyone is going to, should be able to maintain their pay scale, it should be the people actually creating the comics, the writers and artists and creators. But then you've got to convince the companies, if they're still going to be part of this, to not set their profit margins as high as they are so that they can fit into that model. So, you know, this is a this is a an ethical debate that could be applied to any industry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's it's wow. it's very simple. It's like uh, cuz if you go to work as just an unknown artist, uh you're going to see <coughs> a page rate of between 50 and 75 dollars for doing artwork per page. Um and uh for some smaller publishers less than that. And, uh, and I won't work for that, uh, personally. It's like, uh, I'd rather work on my own and make my money back in selling my property. Uh, it's just, um, I, ca I can't, you know, because that's when you do the math, because uh, I, I did the math one day for somebody. It takes me approximately 12 to 13 hours to draw a comic book page from start to finish. Uh, I can spend as much as 12 to 13 hours on that, doing all of the artwork. That includes pencils, inks, and colors. And that's 13 hours. Now you look at the page rate that you just got paid, $50 to $75 a page. You do the math on that. Sure. You know, uh, all of a sudden you're working for Two sometimes, people. you know, less than minimum wage. Yeah. You know, and I've seen that. I've made that where I was making less than minimum wage because then edits would come in and I'd have to continue working. And uh, that's why, you know, when I go into a project, I make sure, uh, am I the director of this visually or is someone going to be directing me? I need to know. Uh, is the artwork I'm going to do going to be constantly changed with a lot of little editorials? Because um, then uh, artists tend to start cutting corners. And I know I cut corners like crazy um, because in the end, it's about how much I make per hour working on a comic. And I know I'm not the only artist that does that. I know all my friends do that. Uh, and only uh, between 9 and 11% of comic book artists make a good living. The rest of them are starving or struggling. Uh, that's yeah. about 90% of all comic artists. And uh, that includes writers, too. To be honest with you, it's, um, uh, anybody who's a creative in the industry is struggling. It's only that little tiny pocket of people. Uh, guys like, well guys that i'm friends with those guys when they get hired to do a comic book they don't get paid the average page rate they get paid their page rate which is more like 300 dollars to 500 dollars a page yeah and well, uh, and the other thing with the comic industry you know it it is a flavor of the month industry so one person who may be a hot artist or hot writer this month three months from now people may not even care anymore you know 
Uh, and that makes it even more difficult for you guys to continue getting consistent work because there are a lot of people in the industry, like you said, who are struggling to get work right now. So they're willing to take a lower page rate just to get that project done, get their name out there and possibly earn a higher page rate later. So it makes it even more difficult for the guys that are already established to maintain the high page rate that you've been used to or the higher page rate that you've been used to. Right. And, uh, and I never got into that. Uh, the most I made uh, for penciling and inking was $100 a page and, uh, and uh, about $75 a page for colors. And that was good pay to me. And, uh, and I was happy with it. But it's not consistent, like you were saying. It's just not yeah. consistent. Uh, and I've got friends in the industry, and it's, it's, it really is sadly an out of sight, out of mind thing. Uh, if I'm not constantly bombarding my friends in the industry, hey, I'm available. Hey, I'm available. Hey, I'm available. They forget you, and it's not personal. It's, it, they don't mean anything by it. It's just they're bombarded constantly by their own uh, uh, editorial staff uh, and their bosses, the the guys that are in charge, chief, you know, the the chief creative people, and uh, they might not remember you when they've got all this stuff thrown at them. And then so, I go, oh man, I I already put, I already got somebody hired for that. I I'm, I don't have anything for you this month. Well, that they're also, they're also hard career. for work, too. So, you know, if they're spending their time hitting the bricks to try to get the next project and the next project, you know, they can't say, oh, yeah, by the way, this guy's got to come with me. You know, they yeah. don't have that luxury. Nope. So it's, oh. it's a, a dog eat dog industry, uh, although it's really funny is that um, comic artists get along, even though yeah. we are we all know we compete with each other. We get along. Um, I get along with all my artists. Yeah, it's like uh, I don't. I don't think I've ever had a beef with uh, anyone but one guy, the whole time I've worked. And I didn't really have a beef with him. I just didn't want to work with him anymore because I got him work, and he didn't return the favor. And I was like, oh, so this is just a one-way relationship. Gotcha. Okay. And so I stopped working with him. But. Uh, uh, we, well, we've got to see a change to this, but uh, I guess we're going to go ahead and wrap up here because I got to get ready to go pick up my woman. Oh. And yeah. uh, Keith, uh, thanks for setting this up. I'm glad because I've wanted to get you on here for a while, Josh. No, I In appreciate fact, being on. We wanted to shoot well, the show from your comic shop. I know. <laughs> Sorry that didn't work out. Yeah, you fucking Look. rat. You close your shop down, you <laughs> bastard. Look, I, I, it is important that I think more shows like this have people like yourself on it, Josh, because it is yeah, one thing to have a lot of people back. talking. Yeah. We, we'd like to have you back on. No, uh, I I'd mean, like to almost we want you me. back in the industry. Uh, uh, oh I'm yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. You know, what are the chances of you doing it again? Slim right now. I mean, we'll see, we'll see how things are in a year or two, but right now, if, 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 if you had to get a definitive answer from me right now, I'd say it's not going to happen. How about, you know, I, just, part of I, the industry. I sent you an invite to that group. I did it while we were talking and uh, I want you to jump in there, but most of all, what if you approach things from more of an independent uh, retailer and did it right out of your home? Well, the, I, there's a lot of logistics involved there. I mean, I, yeah, I am clicking still order. selling comics. I have an eBay store. I'm still setting up at shows when I can. Uh, so I'm still in that aspect of the industry. But it's it's what Keith was talking about. I'm not getting any new product. As far as new release product, I'm buying collections from people or I'm buying things from shows to resell and that kind of thing. But, right. I, you know, I don't know. I'm never going to say never. But, um I've still got some sour taste from the way it all went down with me at the store. Dude, and so dude let me let me just say first and foremost, uh, on the while I'm sad to have seen your shop go, I am happier for you because you seem to be doing a lot better mentally and otherwise. Because I I, I, I was really worried about you uh, during that period. I mean, you know. <laughs> I didn't know Where, if you were doing whereas, that. Whereas I was not worried at all, Josh. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was a lot of concern, you know, because Keith and I talked about you a lot. 
And, um, you know, it's just like, what, what's going to happen? And then when we heard you were closing the shop down, uh, I was, you know, both Keith and I were pretty devastated by that because you were, you were our last vestige uh, in, in Springfield. Because yeah. you, you I, ran and I don't want to, I'm not, I did. do not want to <laughs> throw aspersions towards that other store that sells records and movies uh, and a few comic books. Uh, they used to be more focused on comics back in the yeah. day. Back when, when I worked was, for them. Yeah, back when you worked for them. <laughs> and, um, and then they just became something else. And you were the last real hideaway for, for uh, comics in Springfield. And, and now Springfield really doesn't have anything. I was told there was another shop there, but I, I don't know. There, 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 there are there several are. stores that sell yeah. comics. I think there's only two that are selling new comics anymore but there are yeah. several stores that have the model that keith was talking about where they sell back issues and and pre-owned stuff so you know well, there are places to go in this town to get comics but i think that's pretty much what uh um uh uh cosmic king is doing too yeah, uh, yeah. besides the you know because his big business is selling toys really yep but and he, he also has, he back has a huge business stuff. online he he does great on Amazon and and what, what other he's other avenue it. he uses. Yeah. So yeah, he's killing that department. Um, yeah. Uh, but when it came down to it, uh, uh, you know, um, I don't consider. I mean, they're just not the comic shop you're just going to go sit down in and 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 uh, chat with some fellow nerds. Yeah. And that, that was what your place was to us. And uh, and I yeah. like that. Part of the important thing for me was developing a community of people. And I feel like we did that over the six years that we were open. And I'm very proud of that aspect of it. I wish we could have gone for 600 years, but it just didn't happen. Yeah. I but uh, we're I definitely going to have you back on again. Yeah, uh, I'll gladly. I'll gladly be on again. I, I, um, I, I, I definitely, yeah, I, I think we should try to have you on every so often just to you know, for your well, point talk of about view where and, the pulse and, is. Yeah, where the pulse yeah. is on the industry. Yep, I'm uh, all for because it. It'd be great to get you on as many times as we can. So, but next time you got to uh, send me the memo about wearing a hat because I'm the only one not wearing a hat. Oh, that's yeah, super cool. <laughs> we're, we're, you know, I was told that I shouldn't wear hats, and so therefore I wear them. Ah, but uh, my I big thing is. I promote oh, the yeah. military. I support all my yeah. veteran buddies, and I always wear my um, army stuff. Uh, it's it's just my way of letting people know I'm a proud veteran, and I support all my veteran bros, and that's why I wear ball caps. That's awesome. So, and I've got a lot of military hats. He, Keith's seen them all. <laughs> <laughs> and I was oh, told I should just wear this hat. Yeah, so, all the time. Uh, <laughs> it's in the drawing. See the drawing in the corner. See oh, it yeah, it's in the drawing. And in fact, that hat I'm wearing in that photo is actually my Punisher hat. Oh, okay. Uh, in that photo. Because I also have a Punisher cap that I like to put on every once in a while. Because to me, that also represents Rangers. Uh, in, I can in, see that. Because a lot of Ranger units have the uh, Punisher skull. Oh, nice. They use it on purpose. They've been told, you shouldn't do that, but it's like tough titty. And they do it. And uh, I love them for it. So uh, with that, Look, I guess uh, that uh, there over here, that's Josh. And down Thank here, you for having me. That's Keith. And uh, this is Pop Culture Minefield. And we're out of here. Hey guys, thanks for watching Pop Culture Minefield. If you've enjoyed the show, please remember to like and subscribe. And don't forget to hit the bell icon. Remember, you can find us at Pop Culture Minefield on both Facebook and Instagram. Thank you again.